Hundreds dead, thousands infected across multiple continents, millions quarantined with whole... The coronavirus proving to be unpredictable as the nation's top health experts try to pin down who's most at risk. Now, as we're seeing weeks move into months with this crisis, we know that a lot of our initial thoughts were not accurate. We are seeing some younger folks who can get hospitalized and can also get very sick. Information out of China initially pointed to older people being hit the hardest, but the latest CDC data paints a different picture. Patients between the ages of 20 and 54 make up nearly 40% of COVID-19 hospitalizations in the U.S., with 12% of intensive care patients between the ages of 20 and 44. What's not clear is how many of the young patients had underlying conditions, making them more vulnerable. The death rate among this younger group remains far lower still compared to those 65 and older. No matter how young you are, if you have an underlying serious medical condition, you're going to potentially get into trouble. But if they don't have underlying conditions, that will be something we have to really examine as to why we're seeing it here, but we didn't see it in Some China. of the world's most iconic cities, desolate and a devastating global milestone, international cases surpassing 300,000. Now the Olympics, symbol of unity and human achievement, under threat, a decision to come within a month but Canada and Australia already pulling out. Italy suffering its deadliest day, its death toll now 5,500. Italy's hospitals are battlefields. It's a, a very dangerous, it's a, a disaster, it's a, a, a tsunami. The worst crisis since World War II, says its Prime Minister. Italian nurses posting pictures of their exhausted faces, scarred by masks. In Spain, more than 2,000 have died. Its leader warning, the worst is yet to come. Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel is in quarantine after her doctor tested positive. But this morning, hope from Britain's Oxford University telling NBC News they may have a vaccine within six months. The target is to be able to say that you've got a working vaccine as early as July. That's the, the ambition. Absolutely, not guaranteed, but I think we have a fair chance of doing that because we're using a vaccine type that has been in thousands of people before. Other vaccines are in development in the US, Germany and China. We are aiming to make not millions, probably not tens of millions, but ideally hundreds of millions of doses of this. All the patients in this room, all the feet that you see, they all have COVID. The frustrating thing about all of this is it really just feels like it's too little, too late. Like we knew, we knew it was coming. Today is kind of getting worse and worse. We had to get a refrigerated truck to store the bodies of patients who are dying. We are right now scrambling to try to get a few additional ventilators or even CPAP machines. If we could get CPAP machines, we could free up ventilators for patients who need them. After thousands flooded Sydney's popular Bondi Beach in recent days, defying social distancing orders, on Sunday, it was deserted. Authorities were forced to close most of Sydney's main beaches to stop people breaking the rules. This is not something that we're doing because we're the fun police. This is not something that the government is doing um, because we want to make life easy. This is about saving lives. The number of coronavirus cases in Australia is rising by the day. And so too are the strict measures to slow its spread. Days after the government closed its borders to foreigners, Australians have been told not to travel within the country either, unless it's essential. And this could be the new normal for months. The medical advice is very clear. There is no quick solution. We have to steel ourselves for at least the next six months. And the measures that we put in place, we need to be prepared to carry on for at least the next six months. 
A convoy of military trucks passes through the northern Italian city of Bergamo. Crematorium so overwhelmed that the military is transporting the dead. Una, due, tre. And there are many, many dead. More have now died from COVID-19 in Italy than in all of China, where the virus first emerged. That's despite Italy having far fewer overall cases. The question, why? And what can America learn from it? In addition to sending a plane full of supplies, if you want to say something, Chinese have also sent the vice president of the Red Cross, who gave this explanation. You are not having very strict lockout policy of the city because the public transportation is still working and people are still moving around and you are still having like dinners and parties in the hotels and you are not wearing masks. Here in Rome, it's plain to see officials are putting ever more stringent policies in place trying to keep people home. But as you can see, there are plenty of Romans out disobeying the order. If I stay here every day, I risk contagion. There aren't rules that people don't understand. It seems like Italians don't get it. They shouldn't stand less than a meter apart. Lots of people are afraid. They are taking the situation very seriously. They go around in face masks and keep their distance. They try to avoid contact, while others act like nothing's happening, like it's a normal flu. They're underestimating the problem. Italy declared its first positive cases at the end of January. The prime minister moved quickly to declare a state of emergency. But it would not be until three weeks later, on February 23rd, that the government started to ban public gatherings, close schools, and asked anyone who might have been exposed to self-quarantine in northern Italy, where most of the cases were at that point. Leaders said... An MTA worker killed in a suspicious fire in the subway system. Take a look at video from Citizen App. Black smoke coming out of three subway grates. This is in Harlem at 111th Street and Lenox Avenue. 17 people were injured. The Metro North train had yet to make its first express stop when it plowed into an SUV that was on the tracks. Moments later, several rail cars were on fire, smoke pouring from the windows. People were pulling the windows off, trying to get out through the emergency windows, screaming, yelling. It was just total panic. The Metropolitan Transit Authority says the northbound train struck this Jeep Cherokee, pushing the SUV about 10 train car lengths before it exploded. This is a truly ugly and brutal sight. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo says the electrified third rail, which powers the train, dislodged on impact. The third rail of the track came up from the explosion and went right through the car. The MTA says when the train safety gate came down on top of the Jeep, the female driver got out to inspect it. She then returned to the car and drove forward. The train collided with the Jeep, pushing it hundreds of feet. To see what I saw in that front train is something that I will never forget. I am amazed that anyone got off that train. Hundreds of passengers walked through the snow and ice in the freezing temperatures to safer ground. It could be a lot worse than having to walk up here a couple miles in the cold. It is the deadliest crash in the history of Metro North, a railroad plagued by problems. In December 2013, four people died when a train derailed in the Bronx. An investigation found the conductor had fallen asleep at the controls. Seven months earlier, 76 people were hurt when two trains collided in Connecticut. While NTSB investigators will now analyze the train's event recorder, the transit chief believes the train was moving at full speed on impact. I believe the maximum allowable speed is 60 miles an hour here. Doña Dominga doesn't have enough water to wash her hands, which is regarded as the first line of defense against the coronavirus. What's left here is for drinking, because a cistern truck won't bring her weekly ration until tomorrow. Her vegetable patch has been reduced to tiny onions, watered with what's left from the rinse cycle of her washing machine. But Dominga doesn't blame the lack of water on Chile's severe drought. I would ask the government to leave some of the water that all the fruit groves are using to us so that we can live too. 
In Chile's rural Petorca region, the contrast is striking. Lush green hills of avocados for export, surrounded by totally parched land. It's possible because Chile's water law and water code allow the state to grant free access in perpetuity to economic interests. In 1980, when General Augusto Pinochet came up with his new constitution and water law, no one raised a red flag because there was plenty of water to go around. Back then, no one could have envisaged the impact of climate change, nor the extraordinary expansion of Chile's agricultural and forestry industries, which are more and more leaving families who have been farming here for generations high and dry, without a drop of water. Agricultural engineer Rodrigo Mundaca leads a nationwide movement to change Article 19 of the Constitution, which establishes that water is an economic as well as a public resource. On our visit to Petorca, we stumble into a large tube used to carry water up the hill to a massive avocado plantation from a now dry well. This is highway robbery to capture underground water even after the river has gone dry. It is illegal, but the state turns a blind eye. Small farmers and ranchers in Petorca can't afford to drill up to 200 meters to access underground aquifers. These are a sign of protest, hung by farmers. An estimated 10,000 animals have died of thirst in the last six months alone.